Hi guys, it's week 7. It's Tuesday, CVPP lecture. Today's an important one. We're going to be talking about ASDs, atrial septal defects, the different types of those, uh, as well as tetralogy of flow. And what else? Ventricular septal defects. We're not going to go crazy into those. And we'll start the disease of the pericardium. So kind of a big lecture today. Here we go. And I apologize in advance. I got that little cough again going on. I had my booster shot uh, for the Moderna. Or Moderna vaccine, the booster. Oh my God, it kicked my butt. I haven't been sick like that for probably 30 years. So I think that's underreported. That's definitely my wife, the same thing. Her boss, the same thing. Two of her coworkers, the same thing. That that booster is tough. But I'd still rather have, if that's what the COVID is like, I certainly don't want that. But it's day three, and I'm probably about 80%, but I'm still coughing a little. Anyway, here we go. So let's talk about the atrial septal defects. Now, th now these are not, remember we talked about the the PFO, right? Peyton Framino Valley. We talked about how that's not a problem unless you develop pulmonary hypertension and it pops that that unsealed valve open and you get a pathological right to left shunting of blood. That's not considered one of these atrial septal defects. So atrial septal defect is you're born with a hole. You're just born with a hole somewhere in the intraatrial septum. Uh, and there's no, don't, don't have to worry about pressure. There's always a flow of blood, pathological flow of blood. Starts left to right, and then it can become right to left, as we'll see here. Did we talk about, yeah, we did talk about Eisenmenger syndrome. If the hole is big enough, remember Eisenmenger syndrome is if you flood the lungs with too much blood from the right side of the heart, it can ruin the lungs. And it, you can uh, develop pulmonary hypertension from the scarring and the fibrosis that occurs. And you can wear out the right side of your heart. And that pulmonary hypertension will raise the pressure in the right side of the heart to the point where you'll get a pathological cyanotic right to left shunting of blood uh, between the atria. And we said the body does not like that type of blood shunting at all. Um, so yeah, these can all turn into Eisenmenger syndrome. Not as quickly though, it's usually a slower process compared to the ventricular septal defects. So here they are, we have the ostium segundum defect, by far the most common. Then we have the ostium primum defect. This one is dangerous, and so we'll look at that. Then there's the sinus venosa defects. Uh, which uh, we'll get to. And we're not going to talk, this one's incredibly rare, the coronary sinus defect. All right, here's just kind of a overview of these different uh, defects. So uh, septum segundum defect occurs somewhere in the, usually in the valve uh, of the fossa ovale, or the uh, fossa ovalis, or the oval fossa. This isn't correct, foramen ovale is before birth, right? It's fossa ovalis now, slide six. And yeah, then there's the sinus ven venosa defects. There's a superior one. The inferior one we'll talk about, that's more rare. Then you can have this ostium primum defect uh, right here, which could be dangerous because it could connect with the powerful left ventricle. And Eisenmenger syndrome can start very quickly if in that in that case. And the rare coronary sinus uh, ASD uh, is down here by the coronary sinus. All right, let's get into them, though. Here's the ASD, or here's the ostium secundum atrial septal defect. It's the most common one. Sometimes it's just called the secundum ASD or the septum secundum defect. By far the most common type ones that kids are born with, probably 85% of the time. Females are much more prone to these conditions. 70% of these occur in females. Uh, it is a true hole somewhere in the fossa ovalis. Specifically, it's in the valve of the fossa ovalis. 
And we remember we, we learned how thin that tissue is. You can shine a light through it and see the other side. And uh, these are typically not super dangerous, and they can even scar shut with the passage of time if they're not too big. Uh, if they're good size, though, they can, patient can develop Isomenger syndrome and get a cyanotic pathological right to left shunting of blood through it eventually from lung damage and pulmonary hypertension. This is not the same as a patent foramen ovale. Remember, that's where the limb and the valve of the fossa ovalis didn't fuse together like it was supposed to do. So this is completely different. It always shunts blood, and it starts out as a left-to-right shunt of blood. That's prob Remember, we said the body can tolerate losing oxygenated blood, but it doesn't tolerate mixing in deoxygenated blood. It could take 20 to 30 years before Isomenger syndrome uh, starts uh, on these people, and then they start to become cyanotic. All right, that's all we'll say about that. The superior sinus venosa defect, this is about 5%, so it's more rare for sure. This is a problem with the embryological development of the sinus venous, uh, venosa, sorry, sinus venosus. Um, some authors don't like to classify this as a true atrial septal defect because it does involve the superior vena cava often times in a uh, or the pulmonary veins, so technically that's away from the atrial septum. So some authors don't classify it. You have to check with your board book. Ours do, so uh, we will call these venous sinus defects part of the ASD family. Okay, so the superior sinus venous def uh, venosus defect, it always involves an abnormal fistula or communication between the right pulmonary vein. Usually, remember, there's four pulmonary veins coming back to the left atria. It's usually the superior right pulmonary vein, and that connection usually goes to the right atrium, or sometimes it goes to the superior vena cava, or it could go to both of those at the same time. Uh, pulmonary vein continues on and still connects normally to the left atrium as as normal. So this is going to allow for, uh, for oxygenated arterial blood, fresh, coming right back from the lungs to spill into the deoxygenated blood of the right atrium. Uh, and it's typically tolerated pretty well because the pressure of the pulmonary Veins is not super high, so it's not going to be shooting in there like crazy. So here's a cartoon of it, a couple uh, defects. So it's always a connection between the pulmonary veins. So here's the pulmonary vein. There's the inferior. Uh, there's a pulmonary vein. There's the superior. Uh, that's the pulmonary artery up there. Okay, so here we have an abnormal communication. We could call that a fistula. Or it might actually be a tube like this uh, growing between the pulmonary vein and the superior vena cava. So we're losing some of that nice oxygenated blood, right? Oxygenated blood's getting in here and kind of being lost into the deoxygenated blood of the right atria. And here's another connection. It could be both of these. It could be one of these. There's another connection between the inferior pulmonary vein, and this one's directly connected to the right atria. So in both of these cases, we're losing some of that good oxygenated blood, but we still, the other the vein is fine. Uh, and then this will continue on to connect. I mean, where's the left atria in this view? This is more of a true anatomical view. The left atria was right here. I mean, I could draw it in, so it'll be connecting to right there. Um, so, that's a superior sinus venosus defect, or sinus venous defect. It's typically not dangerous, as we said. It's under fairly low pressure. Uh, Isomenger syndrome could start in middle age or even later in patients, so not super, super worrisome. The inferior sinus venous defect is very rare. I almost didn't mention it, but... Uh, the connections are a little weird. The inferior vena cava 
is abnormally connected typically to both the right atria um, where it's supposed to be, but it's also connected to the left atria. So it has a straight connection, a long tube going over and connecting the left atria, which is just strange. All right, and therefore the, the deoxygenated blood is getting into the getting into the oxygenated blood of the left atria, and we know that the body doesn't like this, so this defect isn't tolerated quite as well. An osteum primum defect, uh, so this is a hole in the intraatrial septum, uh, but down by the tricuspid valve. And embryologically, the, the endocardial cushions are supposed to come down and seal this natural hole, and they fail. So it's a failure of the development of the endocardial cushions embryologically. May or may not communicate with the left ventricle uh, through an atrioventricular septum. I think I cut those out, but I had you watch my video on the, an, the anatomy review uh, of the heart. But remember, the weird thing about the right ventricle is it does have a small connection, or it has a wall normally between the bottom of uh, the anterior, sorry, the anterior inferior portion of the the right atria, and the powerful left ventricle. So if this osteum primum defect gets between those two or is involved, and it communicates with the left ventricle, then you have a very dangerous situation, because every systole you can have you're going to have uh, blood blasting into the right atria and way overfilling the right atria. Uh, and that's no good. Eisenmenger syndrome can can start very quickly because of that. So yeah, the, if it isn't involved in the atrioventricular septal defect, or if, if the osteoprima defect involves the atrioventricular septum, then that high pressure can fly in and you can get Eisenmenger syndrome very quickly. Here's a kind of coronal view of a cadaver heart. It's not, of course, it's not an anatomical position, but it's pushed out into that typical view that you see by the slice. And here's the interatrial septum is all in pink. So ASDs, oh, ASDs can really occur anywhere in here. But this thick part down here, you can see there's a mitral valve, a cusp right there. There is part called the atrial ventricular septum where you can get a defect through. Uh, and that's a uh, osteum premium defect, and that's dangerous because you have, you, I mean, you have high power, high pressurized blood in the left ventricle flying in during systole, way overfilling the right atria. And so that's a uh, osteum premium defect. So what's the treatment for any ASD? Well, if it becomes symptomatic, it needs to be surgically closed. And here's a example of an ASD that was closed. You can see the little. Uh, sutures here, closing it. Looked like a pretty big one. They looked like they had a graft this one in. Um, but it'll heal up. But the problem is, the, it'll of course, when tissue heal, it scars and laminar flow is disrupted. And so anytime laminar blood flow is disrupted, if you get a dose of bacteria in your mouth from going to the dentist and you get a lot of bleeding and your mouth is dirty, uh, the bugs can fly around and they can stick to this roughness, and you can develop a endocarditis or a bug infection of the heart, which can be very dangerous. Uh, so that would be a bacterial endocarditis if it's bacteria that stick there. The bacteria, let's say there's one bacteria, they breed like bunny rabbits, right? Pretty soon the bacteria infection is all over the place, and it's, it's kind of messing up the flow of blood. And if one of these pieces breaks loose, then you got yourself a embolism called a septic embolism. And if this occurs on the right side of the heart, well, that's better because that'll go get stuck in the lungs. You have a pulmonary embolism. If it occurs on the right side of the heart, you're gonna you're in big trouble. That could cause a stroke, or depends where that. It's like Russian roulette. Who knows where the embolism will end up? But if it's on the arterial side could cause a heart attack, it could go in the coronary arteries, go up to the brain, cause a stroke, could go down, get stuck in the celiac trunk, and you could have a liver injury, 
Remember that celiac trunk goes to the liver, the stomach, and the spleen. You can get infarcts of all those tissue. It can be really bad when you get a blood clot on the left side. Okay, let's talk about a PDA. And that's uh, patent ductus arteriosus. Uh, so we need to talk about some specific anatomy now. We usually don't go this deep into it, but let's let's look at the ascending aorta, the aortic arch, and the descending aorta. So we know we've talked a lot about the ascending aorta. We said the aortic arch is between the beginning brachiocephalic trunk and the left subclavian artery. Um, and we usually call this the descending aorta after the left subclavian vein here. By the way, that's the left common carotid, brachiocephalic trunk, right common carotid, right subclavian. You should know those. I've thrown that on the test before. You know I love my anatomy. But there is technically this first piece after the left subclavian artery, this little piece here, C, that's called the isthmus of the aorta. Some people call it the isthmus of the descending aorta. And the isthmus of the aorta has a little embryologic connection, which once connected to the pulmonary trunk, as we'll see. And that's where the, uh, that's where this, this defect occurs. This is where this PDA is patent means open and a ductus arteriosus is an embryological connection uh, between the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. And it's supposed to seal up at birth, and it doesn't. Some people it stays patent or open. So that's what this is. So normally, duct here's ductus arteriosus. I remember the blood flow uh, through the fetal heart. So this would be fetal. I try to Photoshop this. So I don't know if I did the greatest job, but I think you'll get uh, the idea. So this is the fetal heart. And remember that this is the inferior vena cava. That's got all mom's super oxygenated blood. And remember, it goes th it goes through. There's a little fin right here uh, that guides the blood into the fossa ovale or foramen ovale. Right? This is open in in newborns or in unborns and fetuses and it shoots in the super red blood shoots in uh, to this ventricle or to, to the left atrium here and you can't see it but it would go right across like this and get into here and so then there's the left atrium we have blood comes into here and then systole occurs so we have very nicely oxygenated blood uh, by this setup. We have deoxygenated blood coming back from the superior vena cava. And some of that mixes with the oxygenated blood from mom coming out of the inferior vena cava and uh, kind of made it pink. So this is kind of an in-between blood here. Um, and normally the lungs are not developed. Right? They're beaver dams. They're all scarred up. So it's like a beaver dam. So these arteries work, these pulmonary arteries work, uh, but they don't work very good because of the beaver dam. So you have high pressure here. So this semi-good blood is actually encouraged to go into the really oxygenated blood through this ductus arteriosus. Okay, and that's how that, that system works. All right. Um, yeah, so everything I said, so therefore most of the pulmonary blood passes through this patent ductus arteriosus here in embryological days. And then it goes back to the placenta. I'm not going to go through though. You've had this already uh, somewhere, I believe. Uh, but there's, maybe you haven't, so um, here's that same blood coming down the um, coming down the aorta and the mom's placenta is, is almost negatively pressured, so very low pressure here. So it encourages this blood uh, to be sucked out through. Here's the umbilical arteries heading back to mom here. Umbilical arteries are uh, attached usually to the, uh, the common iliac arteries here. But it, they head back and they go back to mom. 
and then mom's oxygenated blood comes comes through here through umbilical veins right remember that through the liver there's a ductus venosus I don't need to get into all that um, but yeah so that's the story with that and so normally that ductus arteriosus dries up uh, even before birth it should be dried up and it forms a ligament which we saw in gross too back when I was teaching anyway I showed you the ligamentum arteriosum which is non-patent it's not open however in about 0 0.05 so about five times more common than Marfan syndrome uh, kids don't are born with a ductus arteriosus that's not scarred shut um, and that's no good and because the pressure is going to dramatically change when the child is born the lungs become functional the alveoli, alveoli open up and that beaver dam is removed and so now we get a situation uh, where well let's just look at the picture what happens so now we get a situation where we have very high pressurized blood flowing here in the left atria especially during systole the the left ventricle will shoot blood under very high pressure out through the aorta and there's a patent patent means open ductus arteriosus because this blood is way higher pressure than the venous blood coming back um, we were losing some of that good arterial blood into the venous blood and it goes right back to the lungs the lungs are happy the lungs are really getting a high dose of oxygenation which they don't need I mean we have a system to take care of for that already but you're losing some uh, plus you're getting the volume of blood go into the lungs is the concern you have too much blood volume go into the lungs and that's going to cause pulmonary hypertension and your right heart is going to have to try to overcome that uh, and eventually the pressure can get so high that we get a reverse shunt and then we lose the deoxygenated blood it starts going into the the oxygenated blood and you get a uh, an Eisenmenger syndrome can can occur because of that okay so everything I just said you lose some oxygenated blood uh, can eventually cause Eisenmenger syndrome though as I just explained okay so these children typically do become hypoxic pretty quickly and um, why do they become hypoxic well th because the extra blood ruins their delicate lungs really quickly and they develop pulmonary hypertension and then you get a reverse shunting of blood not between the any of the atria or ventricles but the shunting of blood is between the pulmonary trunk um, something to note here for board authors sometimes this is called the pulmonary artery I've heard it called the common pulmonary artery as well and not the pulmonary trunk so some authors pathology authors were taught that way so um, be careful of that it's an abnormal shunting te technically between the pulmonary trunk uh, and the isthmus of the descending aorta but if the board question says it's an abnormal shunting of the pulmonary artery and the aorta that would be the correct answer even though it's I mean technically not correct all right 65 percent of newborns will die within six months if this is not surgically fixed uh, from right heart failure um, and the worst thing about the PDA it's bad enough in and of itself but they're almost always accompanied by a ventricular septal defect and that's what makes these so dangerous Eisenmenger start so quickly if there's a ventricular septal defect because now the lungs are just getting way way too much blood well, inter so let's talk a bit about the interventricular septal defects so the interventricular septum of course is the muscular wall that separates the right from the powerful left ventricle much much thicker than the interatrial septum is uh, just like the the atrium it has or the interatrial septum it also has a muscular part and a thin membranous part take a while guess where most of the ventricular septal defects occur well the thin membranous portion is where they usually occur 
thickest is we've seen in gross 2 lab we've actually seen these uh, this is the muscular portion the thinnest is the membranous the membranous has the usually has the uh, the bundle of his lives uh, inside of this tissue or passes some of its fibers can pass through this tissue remember that's the bundle of um, his is uh, close to the central fibrous region of the the fibrous skeleton unlike the atrial septum um, it is normally intact remember the the intraatrial septum has a whole fossa ovale in it the oval fossa um, that's not true with the ventricle the intraventricular septum is there's never a hole in it so uh, if you are born with a hole in it there's there's no patent Patent foramen of any, foramen of any kind within the ventricle, as opposed to the atrium. So it's just like the ASD. It's simply a hole that develops somewhere uh, in the interventricular septum. Now, just like we said, this is really important. We said a atrial septal defect is the most common congenital defect in adults. You remember why that was? Why does it take so long for them to catch this? Because holes in the intraatrial septum aren't under super high pressure, right? There's only atrial systole, so uh, the extra blood going to the lungs is slow, so it takes longer for Eisenmenger syndrome uh, to come on. But in these ventricular septal defects or VSDs, these are the most common congenital heart defect in pediatric population. So these become symptomatic and are caught, whereas the ASDs aren't caught for many years. And why would that be? The left ventricle is filled, uh, or is powerful, right? So if you have a hole between the left and the right ventricle during systole, you're going to get a lot of blood dumped into the, to the left ventricle, or into the right ventricle, and it can ruin the lungs more quickly. Let's, uh, why, why does this one become symptomatic so early? I, I kind of spoiled the party here. Yeah, because of the ventricular systole is so powerful. The left ventricular systole is so powerful. Uh, more blood is blasted into the right ventricle, and Eisenmenger syndrome can start much more quickly in this scenario. What's the epidemiology of VSDs in general? Um, pretty high number, surprisingly. It's not like Marfan's 0.01. Uh, no, it's in the incidence uh, is 0.25% of all live births. Uh, so the prevalent, you double that for a prevalence, is probably around 5%. There's people walking around with these things. Of these VSDs, 70% of them occur in the membranous portion of the interventricular septum. The other 30% is in the muscular portion. Here's one that's in the muscular portion. And there's a picture of it. So there's the left ventricle. Systole has occurred, and we're blasting a ton of blood. We're overfilling the stretchy right ventricle. Remember, the right side of the heart can stretch like crazy. So it can accommodate this blood, but the lungs can't. So all this extra blood goes into the lungs, and the microcirculation is just overloaded with blood and ends up scarring and damaging things. And now the right heart has to work very hard to push through that scarred up damaged microcirculation and it wears out and then you die of right heart failure if something isn't done about this. So you can see why Eisenmenger syndrome can start. T really high levels of blood are bombing the lungs in the situation. Let's meet the four. We're not going to dig into these too deep because they're pretty self-explanatory, but there's a membranous interventricular septal defect. Um, typically these are small uh, these are the most common little tiny holes in the membranous interventricular septum. They also tend to heal up by themselves. Perimembranous defect is large hole. Um, this one is very dangerous. You can get a lot of blood dumped into the right heart and into the lungs through these perimembranous defects. Then there's a muscular interventricular septal defect, which we just looked at uh, right there. Is a member or is a uh, Muscular interventricular septal defect. Did I say membranous? Muscular interventricular septal defect is right there in the muscular portion. Um, commonly occur more in the anterior part of the heart. 
uh, so about 30% of them occur in the anterior part of the heart. Um, rarely, there's a complete absence of the interventricular septum. So maybe this whole thing is gone. And basically, the baby is born with just one ventricle. And that's a medical emergency. They don't live long uh, with that uh, situation. But luckily, it's very, very rare. Small, so in general, small ventricular septal defect, really no big deal. They don't have to have emergency surgery. They usually scar up and seal as the child goes without causing Eisenmenger syndrome. The rule is five millimeters. So if they're five millimeters or smaller, just watch them. They are going to be at risk for future bacteria, endocarditis infection, so because of the scarring that occurs. Um, here is a that's a larger one, though, in this person who died. You can also see the ASD that's in this person who died as well. Slides a little out of place, maybe. Uh, but yeah, so they are at risk. Even if it closes up, they're at risk for uh, endocarditis. And yeah, because it's a rough, scarred up area in the perfect place, we've explained that where bugs stick, so you develop a bacterial endocarditis and part of that bug ball can break loose and cause a septic embolism and now you're in big trouble if, especially if it occurs on the left side of the heart you can end up with a heart attack a stroke uh, lose your liver lose your spleen lose your stomach lose your intestine just think of think of the highway think of all how, that's why we study all those arteries and veins right you guys and second quarter you're like oh why do I have to know all these things because all those veins can get or arteries can be clogged and cause a stroke somewhere. You guys are primary health care providers. You need to know that stuff. So anybody who's had ASD or VSD that's healed up, they always are given antibiotics prophylactically before any type of uh, big procedure because they know there's a risk for endocarditis if they don't do that. Uh, now, large VSDs, uh, so anything 5 or under is really no that big of a deal, but uh, in between 5 and 20 is kind of, you have to watch it and see which way it's going to go. But if you get over 20 millimeters, the whole, and they can tell on ultrasound uh, and CT, they can tell how big that hole is. Uh, those can't wait. Surgery is, is indicated. Um, death is almost certain, or ruining your heart is almost certain if that isn't uh, fixed. Eisenmenger syndrome can start within days, sometimes even quicker depending how big it is. Okay, the tetralogy of Fallot. Um, so I'm not going to go crazy into this. Let's just, because it's really four things that we've been talking about, and one of them we will talk about in the future. Uh, so the incidence is 0.04%, so a little le less than 1% of the uh, humans walking around with this, although many humans are not walking around. This one you're going to have to have surgery. But tetralogy, tet, tetra means four. So it's a combination of four things that commonly happens to these patients. And you have to have all four of these to get the diagnosis. And so number one, your, your pulmonic valve or your pulmonary valve, or you guys may have learned it as your right semilunar valve, which I told you we should never use in clinical pathology. Nobody ever says that. Um, but that valve is stuck and it doesn't work. So it's a beaver dam. And it actually, the pulmonary vein itself, or the pulmonary trunk, might be very stenotic and narrow to begin with. But you're going to have a beaver dam right there. And so that's not a good thing. That's going to immediately cause right-sided hypertension, right? That's going to elevate the pressure in the right heart. So you're going to have pulmonic valve stenosis. You're going to have a ventricular septal defect of some kind as well. So now you have even more blood dumping into the right side of the heart, which it, it can handle it. It'll stretch out and handle it, um, but your lungs are not going to be happy with that. Although Although it's not even going to get to your lungs, is it? Because you have a pulmonic valve stenosis, so it's hard to get blood to the lungs. The lungs are actually cheated out of blood. So these patients don't have good power. They're not getting good blood. Uh, they have low hypotension and 
uh, because it, all the blood is backing up into the right side of the heart. The right side of the heart is stretching out like crazy to accommodate all this extra blood. And then to solve that problem, the body has actually put the ascending aorta partially covering the right ventricle. So, because we the heart would explode if because of all the blood, if you're dumping blood into the heart via a ventricular septal defect, and you can't dump it into the lungs because of the pul pulmonary stenosis, something's got to give. And what the committee did to fix this problem is they put the ascending aorta partially over the right ventricle, so that that all that blood is now gushing into the, and it's deoxygenated, right? Most of the blood is deoxygenated. Uh, so some of it's going through the stenotic pulmonary valve, but a lot of it is pouring into the, uh, the ascending aorta. And so, yeah, and we said that the body does not like deoxygenated blood mixing in with the oxygenated blood. And then, I mean, this one really shouldn't be in here. Because the right ventricular hypertrophy is because of all these other things. Because the right side of the heart is overfilled, overworked. The heart's trying to pump really hard to get through the pulmonary stenosis. So this is a sequelae of, of all of these things. Right? Or at least these two things. So that's what a tetralogy of flow is. That's emergent, uh, surgery, emergency surgery it needs to be done. And then here's a car. This is a CDC uh, drawing here, uh, but you can see. So we have a huge. There's the right atria, right ventricle. Um, left atria is anatomically correct. You you can see it poking out through here a little. That should be. You shouldn't even be able to see this in a real heart, but they pulled it out here. There's the left ventricle. So we have a huge hole right here. So there's your ventricular septal defect. There is a stenotic. See how they call it pulmonary vein, which is, or maybe they mean pulmonic valve, but it's a stenotic pulmonary trunk here. Um, but the valves are like huge, so this valve doesn't work, so you can't get blood into the lungs, right? The lungs are, uh, the lungs would be here, so you're not getting enough blood this way. So to fix that, look at the ascending aorta. The ascending aorta has come all the way over here, and you can't see the connection, uh, but underneath this there's a connection, so some of the blood is getting out this way. And so this pulmonary, the ascending aorta is being fed by two sources, o oxygenated blood from the left ventricle and deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle. Alright, so that's Tetralogy of Fallot. All right, so that's enough with those things. Let's get to the coverings of the heart. We'll do a little anatomy review here, and then we'll get into pericarditis. So, and usually I, I would put this on YouTube too, but you got to understand this because you won't understand pericarditis, you won't understand cardiac tamponade without understanding the pericardium. And we saw it in gross too. It's a sac around the heart. It's made of a fibrous pericardium and a serous. It's made of three layers. The key here is, notice that it encompasses kind of the roots of the great vessels. So the ascending aorta is covered by it. So is the pulmonary trunk is covered by it as well. Um, so that's an important concept. Who are the great vessels, by the way? It's a good little board question. So the ascending aorta, pulmonary trunk, superior vena cava, yep, that's covered right there, superior vena cava. The weird thing is not the inferior vena cava. It's not part of the, quote, great vessels. So that's an interesting, good, testable fact there. All right, and you can see. So what if we, we've talked about aneurysms, a uh, Stanford A. Let's say you have a dissection and it bleeds. What's going to happen? And this is welded, right? This is welded together. This is airtight. So this will all fill up with blood. And it'll, it can't get out here, so it pushes in on the heart, and you can basically strangle the heart. That's called cardiac tamponade. 
So again, it's there's three layers. There's a fibrous pericardium. There's a serous pericardium. The serous pericardium is split into a parent and a visceral layer, parietal pericardium, serous pericardium, and visceral serous pericardium. The visceral serous pericardium, a.k.a. is the epicardium, which cardiologists use. And importantly, between the parietal and the visceral layer, we have our very important pericardial cavity. And that's that can fill up with fluid. You can get a pericardial inf infusion. That can also strangle the heart, that cavity. And we can see it right here, this black thing. So let's look a little more closely at where these layers are. Here's the myocardium right here. Here's the endothelial lining. This is called the endocardium. It's just endothelium like we talked about in blood vessels. Here is the epicardium on top of the myocardium. That Technically, that's the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. And then we have the fibrous pericardium, which is very fibrous. A lot of type 1 collagen in there. Some authors, histologists, separate that into two components, but we're not going to worry about that. But stuck to the bottom of the fibrous pericardium is the parietal layer of the serous pericardium. Right? So those two are inseparable. Now, the serous pericardium, serous means serous fluid. These are epithelial cells, uh, but they secrete a juice, a fluid. And that fluid, about 30 cc's of it, can accumulate here and uh, to prevent friction from building up when the heart is beating. So you normally have a small, super thin layer of serous slippery fluid. And in gross too, you should have been able to feel the slipperiness because on the cadavers, are, it's still there. You can still feel the slipperiness. That same serous fluid is in the pleural cavity and the peritoneal cavity has the same fluid in it. Right, so everything I said, that fibrous pericardium is really tough. It's not quickly stretchable, so if you fill it up quickly with blood, it won't give. If you slowly fill it up with blood from a slow leak of the aorta or slow accumulation of pericardial fluid from an infection, let's say, of the like a, a pericarditis, it can stretch like crazy as long as it's slow. I'll show you some pictures of some huge hearts. But if there's a rapid bleed into it, you're going to die because it's going to squ uh, squish down on your heart and your heart can't beat. All right. And everything I said already, I drew the Stanford A aneurysm or DeBakey 1 or DeBakey 2. Any aneurysm, any dissection that involves the ascending aorta and is down to the root, um, it can bleed into the pericardial cavity and you can get cardiac tamponade, which is strangling the heart. Yeah, oh no, the students are, my students are like, oh, not these damn things again. Yep, they're back. So normally my tests, my midterms and finals aren't cumulative, but because this is now final material, I want you to know these aneurysms again. It should be easy, right? In fact, you're having your CVP test today. You should uh, be, these should be easy for you. Right? Stanford A aneurysms means it has to, the, the dissecting aneurysm has to involve the ascending aorta. And it doesn't care where it goes from there. If it goes into the aortic arch, it's still a Stanford A. Uh, if it goes all the way down, still a Stanford A. It doesn't matter. If it just stay. oh, here's a Stanford A going all the way down. So... Stanford B means it cannot be, the dissection cannot be in the ascending aorta. It has to be in the aortic arch or further down. So you do need to know those again. DeBakey, DeBakey 2 has to be only in the ascending aorta. DeBakey 1 means that it has to be in the ascending aorta and it has to be either in the aortic arch or the descending aorta. So it, it can't be, if it's only in the ascending aorta, then it's the bakey too. If it's in the ascending aorta and the dissection goes into the aortic arch, or maybe it just shows up in the descending aorta, then it's the bakey one. The bakey three means it has to be in the descending aorta somewhere. Cardiac tamponade, so there's BART 
if, if Homer's hands are the fibrous pericardium, he's strangling Bart. Bart is the heart. That's called cardiac tamponade. And again, because the fibrous pericardium doesn't stretch, it can accumulate fluids like crazy to the point where it can compress the heart. What can fill the pericardium? Uh, well, we just said blood from a dissecting aneurysm can that has ruptured. Uh, pus, inflammation, anything that irritates the lining between the visceral parietal serous pericardium, if you irritate those cells with inflammation, they're going to do what irritated cells do. They overproduce their normal product. And in this case, it's serous fluid. And so the inflammation will call the bu cause a buildup of way too much serous fluid, more than 30 cc's. Uh, maybe the inflammation, uh, maybe it's a bacteria that's gotten in there. Um, some of the exudate from the inflammatory reaction may dump in there. So you get pus and serous fluid in there. Uh, but if it, it fills up quickly, it can strangle the heart. And then you get yourself cardiac tamponade. Don't forget, cardiac tamponade equals strangling of the heart. And there's a cartoon of the pericardial cavity just filled with tons of fluid and the heart is being strangled. That's cardiac tamponade. Here's a normal A to P chest film. Oh, so the first thing I always do is look right down here. Costophrenic angles. They look nice and sharp. Great. Because this is where fluid usually collects down here. Heart looks great. Would have liked to see maybe a touch more of it over here, but that's fine. What about this one? Holy smokes. All right. The, of course, the sharp angles are gone there, but the heart is huge. So this is a patient with cardiac tamponade. They actually got cancer metastatic disease, got through the blood and got stuck into the, some of the cancer cells, got into the pericardium, the serous layer, and now we get a wicked inflammation because of those cells. And if the cells get inflamed, they oversecrete serous fluid. Uh, serous pericardium, we already said, it's a double layer made of a parietal and a serous. We already talked about that, right? There's a visceral uh, layer that's stuck to the heart itself. That's called the epicardium. It's also um, covers, this is important, that it covers the coronary arteries. So in that, car in that drawing, we showed the myocardium and then the serous a visceral layer, a visceral part of the serous pericardium. Um, but there's really the coronary arteries and veins and autonomic nerves and lymphatics and fat. They really live between uh, the myocardium and that, uh, we'll just call it the epicardium for a simpler word. And so, um, yeah, if you do develop ventricular hypertrophy from, let's say you have chronic hypertension and your left heart is getting really burly, from working so hard and thick and becoming hypertrophic, it can strangle the uh, blood vessels because the serous pericardium doesn't, doesn't it remains kind of the same size. So as the heart gets big, you can pinch off these coronary arteries and you can get an ischemia because of that and it, it can kill your heart because the coronary arteries are so squeezed. Um, yep, so pericardial cavity, we know that. We said that potential space usually handles about 30 cc's, C milliliters and cc's are AKA's, right? About 30 cc's of pericardial fluid is normal. And we already said it acts to lubricate, to prevent, prevent friction between the fibrous pericardium and the myocardium of the heart. Don't need to worry about that other stuff right now. There's that picture of it again. I could probably take these slides out of here. Um, it does have three functions. It's said to hold the heart stationary within the, the mediastinum. What part of the heart is, where is the heart located with regard to the mediastinum? I used to ask that question, but I made you look online. Uh, to do the anatomy review. If you don't know this question, you should go to that YouTube video and do my anatomy review of the heart. So, no, it's not in the superior mediastinum. Remember, the superior mediastinum is above the 
horizontal line through the sternal angle of Louis. The inferior mediastinum is below the sternal angle of Louis' horizontal line. Um, and remember, the inferior mediastinum is broken up into an anterior, middle, and posterior part. It lives in the middle region of the inferior mediastinum. That's where the heart lives. Uh, the pericardium may act to spread bugs, like if you get a lung infection, the lungs are wrapped around the heart. It's thought maybe, it used to be thought anyway, that it acts as a barrier to prevent inf lung infections from getting into the heart. Although no research with all the people who have had heart transplants nowadays, they don't have a pericardium, right? The, the pericardium is removed, pericardial sac is completely removed. Um, and yet their incidence of a lung, a pneumonia jumping into the heart is no higher uh, than people with a pericardium. So it's, this barrier function is probably doubtful. All right, now let's get to the pathology. So acute pericarditis. Now that we know all about the pericardium, this is the most common condition of the pericardium period. Uh, it's itis is inflammation, so it's an inflammation of the pericardium. And it can present exactly like a heart attack. In fact, 5% of people coming into the ER, all of them thinking they're have a, having a heart attack, it's not a heart attack at all. It's acute pericarditis. And GERD has got to be in there. GERD, pericarditis, myocardial infarction, really can't tell them apart without getting blood work. Check those troponin levels. That will tell the story. I hear some of you going, well, Doc, can we get an EKG? Because I know you can see heart attack on EKG, which is true. That doesn't even work because pericarditis can present with similar EKG findings, as crazy as it sounds. And we'll see maybe a slide. We'll talk about that more when we get to the EKG section of the class. There are two general categories of pericarditis. There's infectious, usually from bacteria or virus, and then there's non-infectious. Both of them, however, the cause is inflammation because an autoimmune attack results in inflammation. I'm writing so slow with my finger, I know, that's why I don't write much. Well, you know the word. Inflammation. I've got to write at least one word today. I probably spelled it wrong, too. So that's all you're getting. Um, um, yeah, there's two M's in there. Yeah, but both... I wrote it right here. Both of these conditions... I should read my slides, maybe. Both of these conditions do involve an inflammation. So that's the ultimate cause of this. It's just what causes the inflammation is the question. So infectious, that was the first category. Infectious and non-infectious pericarditis means a bug. Uh, usually a virus or bacteria has gotten in there. It's irritated the serous cells that line and make up the pericardial cavity. And we said when cells get irritated, they oversecrete, they overdo their job. They either overdo it, sometimes they don't do it at all. In this case, they overdo it. And they produce way too much serous fluid. And that causes a buildup of fluid within the within the pericardial cavity and we said the per the fibrous pericardium doesn't stretch unless it's super super slow and so if it goes fast uh, you could get cardiac tamponade which is a strangling of the heart and you can die from that who are the bugs uh, so the bacteria are staphylococcus and pneumonococcus uh, viruses are notorious for doing this causing a pericarditis idiopathic means and how do they know all this stuff well, they stick a needle in the pericardial cavity very carefully, and they pull out some juice, and they put it, and they send it to the lab, and the lab works it up and sees who the culprit is. Most of the times, it's viruses. Next is staph, or bacterial infection. Third, most common, is they don't see anything in there, and it's probably a virus that they've missed, or they don't know what it is. But idiopathic is the third most. Actually, the most common of all is... These are out of order. Most common is idiopathic. Uh, so they maybe they just didn't get enough fluid or the lab messed up. Who knows? Tuberculosis in third world countries is also... That, that tuberculosis is a horrible disease. 
Uh, we know it likes the adrenal gland, can cause all sorts of Addison's, or it can cause, uh, it's another cause of uh, primary adrenal insufficiency, worse than Addison's disease, right? Because it usually knocks out uh, the zona glomerulosa and reticularis and um, fasciculata. It knocks out the, all of the, the, the adrenal steroids. So tuberculosis is nasty. Luckily, we don't have it that much in this country. Non-infectious means it's autoimmune attack. So something has changed, uh, like maybe you've had chemotherapy and they've radiated your chest and it's, it's turned on genes that are normally not turned on genes in the serous cells, in the nucleus of the serous cells. Something has turned on genes and these serous cells now are presenting in a way that the body's immune system goes, hey, wait a minute, we used to know who you are, we didn't mess with you, but now I'm not sure who you are, so we better attack. And that's basically an, an autoimmune type attack. There are some other causes of non-infectious pericarditis, so it's not just autoimmune. So status post-myocardial infarction. So people who've had a heart attack uh, definitely can get a secondary a secondary pericarditis, a non-infectious pericarditis. And people with end-stage renal failure can also get pericarditis, which is called a uremic non-infectious pericarditis, or just a uremic pericarditis. Let's look at that one a little more closely. So if the kidney is dying, um, you're getting toxins and you're getting breakdown products the kidney's breaking up, some of that's getting into the blood and floating around in your blood, uh, and it can end up in the microcirculation that feeds the serous cells of the pericardium. Uh, and so it can soak into the nucleus and uh, turn on genes, and then you get kind of an autoimmune attack um, of because of the breakdown products. Not to mention you get high blood nitrogen levels. And that increased blood nitrogen is a condition called azotemia. And we'll talk about that. if we. I think we already talked about that, actually. Um, other causes of non-infectious pericarditis. Maybe it's just a flat-out metastatic disease. You've got cancer cells that have gotten into the pericardial cavity and invaded uh, the serous cells that make up the lining of the pericardial cavity and the body sees those cells and is attacking them. They don't know who those mutated cancer cells are. So you get a rip roaring inflammation and get overproduction of serous fluid. We talked about the radiation induced one again. Uh, and then some of the inflammatory diseases which are autoimmune, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, can maybe mistake the the serous pericardial cells for one of their targets and they can get hit with an infl inflammation, an autoimmune, should have almost called this autoimmune inflammatory disease because that's the basis of the attack. So what's the deal with myocardial associated? How can that, how can a heart attack cause a pericarditis? Well, there's actually two types we need to talk about. There's the early type and then there's Dresler's syndrome. That, what a word. Dresler's syndrome. That'd be a good name for a, like a pit bull or something. Dresler. Uh, that's a delayed onset. So let's talk about these two types. Uh, so in early MI associated pericarditis, and, and what happens is in a heart attack, you have your heart dies, right? One of the coronary arteries, hopefully a small branch, has been clogged up, usually with atherosclerotic plaque, and anything anything downstream dies. So you have a piece of your heart dying and the dead tissue needs to be cleaned up and the body sends an inflammation in to clean up that dead tissue. Well, if that dead tissue is really superficial to the heart, well, what touches the, the top of the heart? Well, the pericardium does, right? The epicardium or the visceral layer of the serous pericardium is right against it. So the inflammation can spread from the heart into the pericardium, or the epicardium in this case. And that's it. You get inflammation in the pericardial cells, and they get mad and start over-secreting fluid, and you got yourself a pericarditis. So this is more common with those small superficial 
myocardial infarctions or just a huge, maybe a full thickness myocardial infarction. Um, but yeah, so this is, is it dangerous? Well, that's a kind of a trick question. Is these early type associated pericarditis dangerous? In and of itself, it's not dangerous. The pericarditis can resolve. I mean, if it doesn't, you can always take the pericardium out. It's kind of extreme, but you could do that. But the problem is the mask. So because pericarditis chest pain is the same as heart attack chest pain, if you get a pericarditis uh, and they work it up and say, okay, you got a secondary pericarditis, you just have a little inflammation around your heart, it's okay. What happens if you have a second heart attack on top of the pericarditis? You won't know the difference. You won't even know you're having a second heart attack, and that's killed many a person uh, because it it makes it. I mean, they've it's kind of tricked them because they think, oh, it's just your pericarditis flaring up. We need no need to run troponin levels again. Um, so it can mask it. So they have to be very careful with that. Now, Dresler syndrome is that late type myocardial associated infectious pericarditis. This is a weird one. So you leave the ER, you maybe or you leave the hospital. You're in the hospital maybe a week, and everything's looking good. You go home, you go back to work, uh, and about five or six weeks later, you get chest pain, and you're like, "Oh my God, I'm having a heart attack." You go back in to the ER, and they run troponin levels, and oh, your troponin's okay, uh, and they do an ultrasound, and oh, you got fluid around your heart again. Okay, you got an inf you got pericarditis. It's not a heart attack this time. So the question is, why is there such a delay? Why is there a five-week delay? And we don't know the answer to that. Um, it's it's autoimmune related. We do know that. And um, it must be something, some genes must have got turned on that gives a different phenotype uh, to the serous pericardial cells. We're not 100% sure what happens, but somehow the phenotype, you know, the look, that's the phenotype, right? Blue eyes is a phenotype. Brown eyes is a phenotype. The phenotype or the look of the serous pericardial cells that secrete the serous fluid just has changed, and the body's immune system has just now figured that out. And all of a sudden goes, hey, we know we used to know who you are, but I'm not sure who you are now. I think you're a bug. And so it attacks, and then you get uh, ear, the inflammation irritates the serous pericardial cells, and they overproduce fluid, and now you get yourself a, a pericarditis. What are the clinical findings? I mean, chest pain is one. Besides, I could have added you know, chest pain. That's probably the number one, chest pain. Sorry for my slow motion writing, but better write this in here. I think I can spell chest. Chest pain. But besides from that, there's a certain type of chest pain that's very distinct, and that's called pleuritic chest pain. People with myocardial infarctions don't have, typically have, uh, they don't have pleuritic chest pain. Pleuritic chest pain, and I've had this before when I had my pulmonary embolism. Oh my god, it was... I've had fractured ribs before. It was way worse than that. I had to have fentanyl. It was the only thing that I was in the hospital, the um, emergency room, for a couple of days with this on fentanyl for a day. It horrible, horrible pain. Worse than fractured ribs. Every time you breathe in, it's like someone's stabbing you with a knife. And you don't want to breathe. You just take little tiny breaths. And that's the key. Taking a, a breath is almost impossible. Um, and then position, it's better to be sitting up than laying down on it. And pulmonary embolism, which I had, also causes pleuritic chest pain. So that's a good question. What are two things that cause pleuritic chest pain? Make a note card of this. Acute pericarditis uh, and pulmonary embolism. What are the clinical findings of pericarditis? Uh, fever. Uh, so that's another common finding. It is an infection, so we're getting uh, we're getting chemicals triggering the brain to cause fever. Uh, dyspnea. It's that's part of the pleuritic chest pain. Again, it hurts to breathe, and then you can get a friction rub too. 
So if you auscultate and with a heart attack, you usually don't have these pr friction rubs. So it's you can go to these links. Just Google auscultatory sounds uh, or heart sounds and and uh, pericarditis friction rub. You can get or you can copy these, these links. I know they're not live. I'm not gonna have time to put these in the comments, but you can go listen to the, what this sounds like. But it's kind of like rubbing your like my skin is really dry so my hands can this mic's probably not good enough to pick that up but uh, and it kind of it kind of makes the the lub dub the s1 and s2 kind of hard to hard to hear um, but yeah so you auscultate down at the the uh, down towards herbs point or the left lower sternal border which is the fourth and fifth intercostal space on the right peristernally peristernal border with a diaphragm because these are high pitch sounds uh, you can have this patient sit up and bend forward in that position and listen for the lub dub sometimes it's a lub dub dub and there's like a delayed lub dub dub and it's all muffled sounding um, so go listen to those that's part of your homework to listen to those for yourself so sometimes it does have three components, like a muffled S1 and then two, two S2 heart sounds. And uh, Washington.edu has some examples of those. Yeah, and some say it sounds like leather straps rubbing across. I guess that's another way. So that's another sign. Um, by the way, here is, you should know these apep monkey areas, uh, aortic, pulmonic, herbs point, tricuspid, mud. Uh, and the mitral auscultation areas because this is the pattern we learned this week in lab well you have to watch the videos this week in lab but we learned how to auscultate I think was it this week I think it was this week but when you say the left lower sternal border they're talking about uh, the fourth intercostal space right here and the fifth intercostal space that's the left lower sternal border herbs point is the third left to third intercostal space pulmonic area is the second intercostal space here and then the aortic auscultation area is the second intercostal space right parasternal border. Right? Remember if you drew there's a clavicle, if you drop a line down from the clavicle, the mitral area should be just inside that line. All right, uh, pericarditis versus myocardial infection pain. Well again, pleuritic chest pain, people with myocardial infection don't have that that pain. They typically sweat like crazy. People with a heart attack, they sweat and they have like a crushing, suffocating chest pain. Often feels like an elephant or car on top of your chest. And then EKG, you can both, both of the conditions can have elevated ST segment, which is very common in a STEMI myocardial infarction. So EKG is abnormal in both, about 90% of people with pericarditis. So very, you have to be very careful about that. And then we'll get to this in time, but there's limb lead too. You can see the, uh, the Q, the R, the S, the tip of the S wave should be way down here, right? See how the down limb of the R never even made it down past the isoelectric line. It's up here in the wind. So that's, ele that's ST segment elevation classic of a myocardial infarction but very common in acute pericarditis as well all right see you guys later